Hallelujah. Acts chapter 19, and, and I'm going to read a couple of verses in chapter 20 as well. We'll tell you, today's is a little bit different. It's going to be a little bit different than I, than I normally preach. The thoughts are going to be a little different. The subjects are going to be a little different. and just it, I, I'm just going with a flow here. Um, I, I wanted to get into the book of Ephesians, and I feel a strong pull to get into Ephesians chapter 6, particularly Ephesians 6 and 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. That one has been, that verse has been resonating in me for, for a few days now. And I was really looking at the armor of God and studying that out. And I've been taking a lot of notes that the Holy Spirit's been giving me. But I'm going to have to take that and put it to the back burner because what he woke me up early this morning to do, I, I just got to digging in there. You know the book of Ephesians is the, is the, it's a letter that was written to the to the general church abroad, but particularly to the church at Ephesus. It was a church that Paul planted there, okay, and, and some time that he spent there. And so the but it wasn't the letter was written a couple years after he left, a few years after he left, and it was sent back to them by the hands of one of his messengers. Okay, so uh, I decided this morning to get up and, and do some studying back because I knew he spent some time there planning that church. He was an apostle. He spent some time there serving them uh, and 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 just teaching them and, and encouraging them and helping establishing the, establish them. Now Ephesians is a rich book. It's a rich book with a lot of good stuff and a lot of good wisdom and revelation and insight. And I'm going to get into that over the next couple of weeks. Uh, but what I wanted to do was go back to the days that he spent at Ephesus first. And I wanted to look at some of the things that happened while he was there, look at some of the things that he dealt with while he was there. And so uh, that's what I want to do this morning. So I'm asking you for a little bit of grace, okay? Amen. Throw some grace my way because this has been developing in me. But I got to tell you, it's developing in me right here in front of you as well. So um, it's just something that I'm working on right now. And I think that over the next couple of weeks, it's going to take a lot more form than what you might see this morning. All right. But it was written, this letter to the Ephesians was written from Rome around AD 62 or 63 while he was under arrest, and it was, he was under house arrest, the Apostle Paul was. He had went to Rome knowing he was going to get arrested. No, as a matter of fact, I believe knowing everything that was about to happen to him, he knew what was going to happen, but he went anyway. And uh, he was under house arrest for a couple of years, okay? We all know what that means, right? Now, he had Roman uh, guards placed outside his door, and he lived for a few years under house arrest there, but while he was there, he wrote letters to several churches. They became known as his prison epistles because they were the, the letters to the churches he wrote while under arrest. The letters to the Ephesians was one, Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon or Philemon, however you want to pronounce that. Uh, that was another one, okay? So those were letters that he, uh, that he wrote while he was locked up, okay? Uh, so I want to I look at Acts chapter 19. And beginning at verse 1, I want to just do some reading through here. Stacey, go ahead and find your place as well. I'll, I'll start off, but then I'll let, I'll let you pick up and join me because I want to read into chapter 20 as well. So let's just be patient do some reading together this morning, okay? Amen. I, think it's, I think sometimes it's beneficial. It helps establish something that you want to build on, especially particularly when we're talking about... A, a, a period of time that he spent with one group of people pouring into them. I want to see what all took place there. Yes. Okay, verse 1. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Okay, so some translations help you to understand that what they're talking about is they hadn't even heard of the Holy Spirit at this point in time, okay? But they were followers of Christ. And he said unto them, Into what then were you baptized? So they said, Into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. So he, he explains to them that John's baptism was the one that come before the Messiah, 
he was preparing people to change their mind. And several of the translations I studied from yesterday said, said that uh, the, 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 he, I love it when she talks to me when I'm preaching. She, she gets all loud and makes all kinds of noise. Uh, but he was, he, he was ministering here at this church for a season. I don't even find my thought again now. And he explains to these disciples that John the Baptist came talking about repentance, changing your mind about Messiah. He was preaching a message that was trying to help the Jews prepare for a mindset shift, a shift in thinking, a shift in theology, because the Messiah, the king who they'd been waiting on, was about to step foot on the scene. And so, that, and so his baptism was in preparation for the Messiah. So Paul said, but now what's, now what's going on here is there is another baptism, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, because Messiah has come now. And he has established, he's building his church, so there's a baptism of the Holy Spirit here. And so when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They gladly believed on him as Messiah. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about 12 in all. Okay, so what you're seeing here, you're seeing the birth of the Ephesus church. Okay, because he, he's here, he finds some disciples in the region, he finds 12 of them to be exact. He begins to teach them and pray for them and baptize them, and the, the, they get baptized in the Holy Spirit, they begin to prophesy. And so, then it says from there, verse 8, and he went into the synagogue and he spoke boldly for three months, Hallelujah. reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. Now, the synagogue was the Jewish synagogue, okay? That's where he was going in, preaching boldly for three months. Uh, now, if anyone could, it was Paul, right? Because he had he was a tri of the tribe of Benjamin. You know, he, he, he had his pedigree in place. He studied under Gamaliel, okay? So he knew, he knew the law. He was zealous of concerning the law before he was converted by Christ, okay? So he goes in there, and he's preaching Christ to, to the Jews in the synagogue, and for about three months, they're allowing him to do it. But then in verse 9, it begins to take a turn. But when some were hardened and did not believe, but they spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. So he leaves the synagogue, and he goes for about two years, and he teaches in the, in the same area, the same region, but he pulls out of the synagogue, and he goes into this school of Tyrannus and he teaches there for two more years so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus Christ both Jews and Greeks okay now it's fixing to get interesting all right now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out of them then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon your Bible might say vagabond if you're in the King James and this is New King James uh, Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits saying we exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches also there were seven sons of Siva a Jewish chief priest who did so and the evil spirit answered and said Jesus I know and Paul I know but who are you then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Now this became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on all of them, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Also many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. Wow. Amazing. Amen? Amen? So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Now, if we were to stop right there, it would sound like the entire situation was, was victorious, and it all went great, it was all awesome, and there wasn't much resistance. But the thing is, is when they converted and they began to burn their witchcraft and sorcery books... You have to go back in history to look at the city of Ephesus to realize the stronghold that idolatry and paganism and idol worship and, and sorcery and witchcraft had on that city, on that region. What happened there was a riot began to take place, which we're going to read about in the next few verses because 
it began to affect the livelihood. Now, now, how many of you know that when you hit the pocketbook, you catch someone's attention? Right? That's really what catches our attention faster than anything. When Jesus cast the demons out of, out of the man Legion and he went into the swine, that's what, what ticked everyone off is that the, the keepers of the swine lost an entire herd of swine as they dove off the cliff into the ocean. That was their livelihood. It was their income. Uh, and so that's, that's what got everybody upset to the point of wanting to stone him to death. Uh, and he had, you remember the story? Same thing here. Same situation. Everyone's excited about Paul and there's miracles taking place. Demons being cast out. People are being healed. But all of a sudden, the livelihood of the city begins to feel the impact of the ministry of Jesus Christ. Because they had the temple of Diana there who at that time, that, that temple at Diana, now Ephesus isn't even standing anymore. There's only one pillar of that city left that's still standing erect. But at that time, it was a very important city on that coast, and the temple at Ephesus was greater than the, the famous temple in Greece. It was uh, greater in size. They, they could fit over 50,000 people in this temple of Diana. It was a big deal to them, okay? It was a big deal to them. All right, so let's read on here. And when these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. So he sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus. But he himself stayed in Asia for a time. And about that time there arose a great commotion about the way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Diana, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. He called them together with the workers of similar occupation and said, Men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. Moreover, you see in here that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people, saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. So Paul was preaching against idolatry in explaining and revealing that there's only one true God, and it's the God of heaven. Amen. Who was not made with human hands, and anything that a human can make cannot be a God. Now that stands to reason, right? Anything we can make cannot be a God. So therefore, now we could take off preaching, but I don't have time to chase that down a side trail right now. But there is nothing on this earth or in your life that should be put ahead of your devotion to God Almighty. Because there is nothing capable of being God in your life or God for you except God. Okay? All right. So then this begins to disrupt things here and they begin to riot. And so uh, not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised and her magnificence destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. Now when they heard this, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. So the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theater with one accord, having seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, Paul's travel companions, and when Paul wanted to go into the people, the disciples would not allow him, because it was getting out of hand. Then some of the officials of Asia, who were his friends, sent to him, pleading that he would not venture into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused, and most of them did not know why they had even come together. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward. And Alexander motioned with his hand and wanted to make his defense to the people. But when they found out he was a Jew, all with one voice cried out for about two hours, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And when the city clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, what man is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple guardian of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Zeus. Now, if you really, if you take a minute and go back and study, it doesn't take any time at all to see that a meteor had fallen from heaven. Okay, a meteor had fallen and, 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 and a piece of it stayed intact. Now, these people, because in Greek mythology, is a big, they worshiped everything, okay? Uh, they're nothing more than their own reasoning. And so uh, they saw this meteor fall from the sky. A piece of it remained intact. So they took it, and they, they thought that it looked like Diana. And so they took it and made it something that they worshipped, and they thought it had been sent down from Zeus. Okay? So they began to worship. That's what this is talking about, all right? All right, where did I leave off? 
36. Therefore, since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. So the city clerk is basically telling them, look, everyone knows what this city is founded on and what it's about and what it's built on. So let's not be rash here, okay? For you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of the temples nor blasphemers of your goddess. Therefore, if Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a case against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you have any other inquiry to make, it shall be determined in the lawful assembly. For we are in danger of being called in question for today's uproar. There being no reason which we may give to account for this disorderly gathering. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. Okay, so everybody understand what's going on here? The guy brought some reason to the crowd, spoke some sanity to them, and he said, they came in preaching about their God, but they did not disrespect Diana or the temple. They didn't steal anything. They didn't do any disservice to anyone. All they done was talk about their God. But in fact, and they demonstrated the power of God as well, okay? That's all that they did. So this clerk says, let's not get out of hand here. We're about to be called into question for this riot. So that concludes that, but then it goes into chapter 20. And for, for a few minutes this morning, I want to read chapter 20. So Stacy, pick up there at verse 1, and let's read together, or let her read, but you follow along with her. After the uproar had ceased, Paul called his disciples to himself, embraced them, and departed to go to Macedonia. Now when he had gone over that region and encouraged them with many works, he came to Greece and stayed three months. And when the Jews plotted against him as he was about to sail to Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. And Sopater of Berea accompanied him to Asia. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> also, all of these other people in Timothy and all of these other people of Asia. These men going ahead waited, waited for us at Troas. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days joined them at Troas, where we stayed seven days. Thanks for that setup, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together, and in a window sat a certain young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep. He was overcome by sleep. And as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down, fell on him, and embracing him, said, Do not trouble yourselves, for his life is in him. Now when he had come up, had broken bread, and eaten, and talked a long while, even till daybreak, he departed. And they brought the young man in alive, and they were not a little comforted. Okay, hold on. I don't want to hear any more complaining about me being along with you. Okay? Right. <laughs> I mean, let's just let's forget that. I mean, I might preach an hour and 15, an hour and 20 minutes tops. Paul preached so long, this guy fell into a deep sleep and plunged from a third-story window. <laughs> Hit the ground and died. <laughs> okay? But they brought him back to life, and he preached from then all the way till daybreak. Okay, so, man, that's over, all right? <laughs> <laughs> I've heard a lot of people preach different messages about Eutychus. It's an interesting story, but I don't have time to go there. Okay, verse 13. Go ahead, then, says. then he went ahead to the ship and sailed to Asos, there intending to take Paul on board, for so he had given orders, intending himself to go on foot. And when he met us at Asos, we took him on board and came to Mytilene. We sailed from there, and the next day came opposite Chios. The following day, we arrived at Samos and stayed at. <laughs> the next day, the next day we came to Miletus, for Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he would not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hurrying to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. Okay, let's pay attention here. I'm going to pick up at verse 17 because we're remember we're about to get into Ephesians for a couple of Sundays, all right? So from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and he called for the or Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. Okay, so now we're getting down to it. He's about to instruct the elders of the church of Ephesus. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I've always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. How I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house. 
testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that the chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy in the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And indeed, now I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. He's imparting here to these elders, okay? This is, this is the apostle who knows his time is short, and he knows he'll never be back to this church again where he spent years of his life, okay? So he's imparting into these elders. <laughs> For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Now let me just say this before I, do, before I go any further down there. He mentioned savage wolves that will come in among you not sparing the flock. The wolves come from the outside, okay? And in any church setting, and even in what we're establishing and building here, there will be those that will try and come in from the outside, and that's just part of the process. But he's warning them, and just like he's always warned us, he's always got us ready. He's wolf-proofed us with the Word of God and got us ready to deal with situations when they come up, okay? So he warns them about savage wolves that would come in from among you, not sparing the flock, and also about people that would rise up from among yourselves, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Okay, so the word perverse there, I looked it up. He's not really talking about sexual things. But what he's talking about is things that would deviate you off the course that I've originally put you on. They will rise up from within you trying to speak things to take you to follow them instead of following the, this example that I've already put in place there. Okay, that's one of the things that you always have to be on the lookout for and you always have to watch for. That's stuff that happens. Stuff that happens, no matter how solid you are, no matter how small you are, no matter how big you are, or anywhere in between, you'll always have to worry about people coming from the outside to bring stuff in or people rising up from within that were not necessarily sent with your vision and they weren't sent with your mandate. And they may mean well and they may, have, uh, they may not necessarily even have bad intentions initially. But the thing is, is that you have to be careful who you give a voice to in your congregation you have to be careful about letting people that have not heard from God about the mandate for this place, this time, this season, this people, and the direction moving forward. You've got to be careful who you let speak into that situation. Because not everybody has heard from God about the direction that the place needs to go. Amen? And so you've got to be careful. And when it comes to that type of stuff, you can, you can rest assured, every one of you, amen, touch your neighbor right now and say, we're in good hands because I take that stuff serious. I always will look out for that and always will be on guard for that. And I'll not let anyone step up in here and try to steer us any direction that God has not said that we should go as a church. Amen. Amen. Anytime you ever come into prayer, this is not me being hateful. This is just me being real. Okay? Not, there's not a hateful bone in my body. You guys know that. But anytime it ever comes into question whether or not I'm hearing from God, you're welcome to find another church to go to. Amen. It's that simple. If you ever in your heart begin to doubt whether I'm hearing from God, then I give you permission freely to pray and seek God and find a place where you can sit under a leader that is hearing from God. Amen? And I'm not going to fight you on the way out the door. I'll bless you on the way out the door and pray for you that you prosper in all your ways. Amen? But the thing is, is that you have to trust that everything that I say, I'm hearing from God. Now, let me tell you this this morning, okay? And this is not boasting, okay? This is just how serious I am about this right here. I've not got up and shared one message, lesson, study, DVD, or CD in the past 18 months that I've been ministering here and 12 months that I've been pastoring here that I did not feel led by God to share. Okay? Not one time. I've never in the past 18 months been at a loss for words, 
You guys know that. I've never been at a shortage of anything to say. I've never been wondering what are we going to do? Where are we going to go? I told Stacy, now this has not always been the case, but I told her when we came out here, I've never in my life had such a clear mandate, Thank you, such a clear call purpose. I knew what I was called to do. I knew what I was to say. I knew what I was to do. I knew how I was to do it. Everything was clear. Now there was a now that's coming out of a season in my life where I didn't have a clue what to do for two years. Didn't have a clue what to do. And the Lord stripped me down of my theology and my doctrines, my beliefs. Everything that could be sifted got sifted. After that, including our marriage. But at the end of that period, we came out of that on top of it. We survived. We came out of it hearing more clearly than we'd ever heard before, seeing more clearly than we'd ever seen before. And we began to catch a vision from God. And that is what brought us. It's the winds of that vision that carried us to Shawnee. Amen. Now, I believe that it could, the same thing goes for many of you as well. And I believe there are some of you that are sitting here right now that are just trying to figure it out. And there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all, okay? My prayer for you is that you figure it out and decide and know if this is the place that God has called you to plug into. And if it is, then let's run forward together. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. Okay, so where do we leave off? Verse 13? Verse 30, 31, I'm sorry. <laughs> I inverted it. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. Then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke that they would see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. Okay, now what I wanted to do was look at that to establish some foundation for where we want to go the next couple of Sundays, okay? Um, but out of that, something that jumped out of me that I want to talk about this morning is, is in chapter 19, beginning at verse 11. I'm going to reread a few verses there. You thought I just passed over it, and you thought, wow, that's a cool story. I can't believe he's passing over that without preaching it. But I'm not. <laughs> Acts 19, verse 11. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exercise you, or we take, what they mean by that is we take authority over you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also, there were seven sons of Siva, a Jewish chief priest, who did this. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. But who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and bleeding, is what the King James Bible says. Okay? So the subject this morning is if you don't know who you are, no one else will know who you are. If you don't know who you are, no one else will know who you are, okay? So I want you to look over at your neighbor right now and tell him, I'm anointed to live this life. Okay? You believe that? There are a lot of times people just say something that I'll tell them to say something and they just say that. Now listen, I want you to think about it for a minute. And if you have a conviction regarding it, and then I, and now that you've had a second to think about it, if you really believe it, look over and tell them one more time, I'm anointed to live this life. Okay, now if you really believe that as I do, and I do, okay, then you believe that ultimately you are victorious uh, in, in spite of any test or challenge that comes your way, in spite of anything that comes against you or at you, you are victorious. Hallelujah. And you believe that, Amen. Okay, now you're not victorious simply when you endure and, and things turn in the direction that you finally have wanted them to all along. That doesn't mean that that's not what gives you the victory, okay? Right. <laughs> now, that's, that's what we think gives us the victory. Now, what we think, vic we think victory is when the desired outcome manifests, okay? But victory is knowing who you are, right. knowing whose you are, knowing who is in you. Understanding your identity causes you to see that I am more than a conqueror. Amen. Amen. 
I am more than a conqueror. So it's not just when things turn the way that I've been waiting on them to turn that I see victory, okay? I have to see victory now ahead of time before I ever get into seeing it manifest in my life. Okay, I think you're going with me now. You're victorious because you have a new nature, you have a new identity, and your new nature is that of a conqueror. Amen? In fact, it's, it's, more, it's, it's more than a conqueror. And we'll get into Romans chapter 8 before this series is over. But the anointing is something I want to talk about for a couple of minutes. The anointing is God's enablement or God's empowerment. So when we say we're anointed to live, live this life, we're saying we're, in, we're enabled and we're empowered by God to live this life. Now, the question I want to ask is what, what life? What, what life are we talking about? Am I anointed to live my life? But listen, and bear with me for a couple minutes. The anointing is not on me to live my life any way I want to live it. Okay, the anointing is not on me to do that. It's not on me to live out my agenda or my own purpose with my life. Right. Now, don't understand me, okay? I want you to understand there's, there's, there's a difference between his presence and his purpose. I'm not without the presence of God at any time in my life. Amen. So let me just establish that so everybody can breathe easy. I'm never without the presence of God. He'll never leave me, never forsake me, okay? Nowhere I can go to get away from the love of God and to get away from the presence of God. That is established. We know that. I'm not going to take the time going over the dozens of verses to establish that. We, we do it here all the time. You know that, okay? But I want you to understand there's a difference between his presence and his purpose. His purpose, okay? And I want to talk to you about his purpose for you. His presence is with me always. It will never leave me or forsake me, particularly in the new covenant where I understand now that he resides on the inside of me. Amen. Okay? But I'm referring to his empowerment to accomplish a specific purpose. Okay? His empowerment to accomplish a specific purpose. Because even though his abiding presence is with me always, it never leaves me, he never stops loving me no matter where I go or what I do or what I choose not to do with my life, but still yet, his empowerment or his anointing that comes up, uh, that comes upon me or rises up within me to accomplish a particular purpose, that is something entirely different. I want to spend a few minutes showing this to you this morning, okay? Look at Galatians chapter 2, verses 19 through 21. Turn with me over there if you would. Galatians 2, verses 19 through 21. It reads like this, for I through the law died to the law that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Now, those are pretty familiar verses, and we preach those around here constantly, okay? But I wanted to use them this morning to establish the fact that it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me, okay? So I want to talk about that the Christ that's living in me and living through me right now, okay? Now, Colossians chapter 3 and verses 2 through 4, Colossians 3 verses 2 through 4 says, Set your mind on things above, not on the earth. Now, I'm going to come back to that. There are a few things in this series over the next couple of weeks I'm going to come back to. That's one of them, okay? Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Because when I was reading, last night I was reading, and i got to tell you a quick testimony too. I was out of it yesterday, did not want to study. Is it all right if I'm just transparent with you? Yes. Do you ever have those days? I didn't want to study. I didn't want to read my Bible. I didn't want to pray. I was tired. I was sore. It had been a long week. Everything had been along. I didn't care about any of it. I went in there and tried anyway, though. I, I mean, I did. I went in there for a couple. I took a stab at it two times for about two hours apiece. And I walked away with nothing. Absolutely nothing. It was just like I was just reading information. It was ink blots on a page. It wasn't talking to me. I didn't feel it. I wasn't seeing anything. I'd get up frustrated and I'd go in the other room and I'd plug a movie in and I'd watch a movie for a couple of hours and doze off and take a nap. Then I'd get up from that, get all excited, go in there, study, nothing. Nothing would come to me. So I finally went upstairs, took a nap, and I came back down a little bit later in the evening. But this time, before I came back down and, and, and prayed, and did my exercises, by the way, <laughs> while I was up there. But before I came back down, I prayed, and I said, Lord, 
I need your Holy Spirit right now, <laughs> okay? I'm not feeling this. And uh, you have to have something on you. You spoke to me three days ago about this Sunday. Now here it is, the eve of Sunday, and I haven't got a clue what to say. I'm not feeling anything. So I'm going to go read these verses out of Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 17. I'm going to read them one more time. But this time, I need you to show me what it is that you have for me. Lo and behold, I went down there and I opened my Bible and stuff started pouring out of it to me. It just started pouring off the pages. So I just took notes all the way up until I couldn't stay awake anymore last night. But, I, but I'm going to come back to that, okay? Because I got some stuff to say about verse 2. But verse 3, look at this. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears then you also will appear with him in glory. Now, is it all right if we just exegete that verse for, for a couple of minutes and I just pull some stuff out of that? Because we've taken verse 4 and we've made that a verse about, about when Christ comes back to the earth. But it's a mistake to look at it that way. When Christ, who is our life, appears. Now, I looked at the word appears, and it doesn't mean returns, doesn't mean comes back, doesn't mean rides in on a horse and appears in the heavens but the word, the Greek word for appears there, it, it translates manifest. Manifest. When Christ, who is our life, manifests, then you also will manifest with him in glory. Now the word glory, you understand, and it had a lot of words. It had like 10 different uh, Greek words there. But they all reference back to the Hebrew word for glory, which is kebab. The kebab of God, okay? Which, and I've told you before, means his weighty presence, his honor, his splendor. The glory of God is the honor and the splendor and the thick, weighty presence. It's a, like a robe, if you will, of his presence, glory, honor, and splendor. Okay, so that's what that Hebrew word is. And there were a dozen, a ten, 10 or 12 Greek words for glory in the New Testament, but all of them in parentheses were referring back to that original Hebrew word, particularly in this verse, okay? So when Christ, who is our life, because we died and our life is hid with Christ and God, right? So when Christ manifests through us, then we also will manifest with glory on us and in our lives. Okay, so whenever we allow Christ to appear in our life, then we manifest the glory of God in this earth. Okay? All right. Now, you're maybe not getting your mind wrapped around it all the way yet, but I'm going to get into this, okay? The life we're anointed or empowered to live is his life here on this earth. That's the life that we're anointed or empowered to live, okay? And I believe this. I believe that each of us has specific giftings and callings that cause his life to manifest differently out of every one of us. In other words, your gifting, your personality, your makeup, what makes you up might cause Christ to manifest differently out of you than he does out of me. Do you understand that? Everybody understand that? But it's the same Christ. But he does different things. And he might look a little different in, a, in the sense of he's coming out of my personality. He's manifesting out of me. So I'm not going to shout and holler and spin like a top. Like, like Nita might, for instance, <laughs> because her personality is totally different than mine, okay? All right, but that's okay. It's still Christ manifesting out of me. Um, <clears throat> your purpose-filled calling might cause you to look and act a little different than I do, but that's okay because I believe that we have a specific purpose, every one of us, okay? The reason why people get tripped up when we talk about predestination as well is because of they're afraid that when you talk about predestination, you're trying to say that choice has been taken away. Choice has been taken away. It's been taken out of the equation and we can't choose. But listen, the only reason people think that when you talk about predestination is because they're leaving a key word out. And if you go back to Romans, 4, Romans chapter 8, in the verses where he talks about how we've been predestined, the, the verse starts with according to his foreknowledge, we've been predestined. Now, foreknowledge is key. It's key. God hasn't laid out a cookie-cutter life for you, okay? He has let you make every choice you wanted to make in your life. You've been predestined in life by God. Now, I need you to get this. This is important. You've been anointed, empowered, predestined by God to accomplish the specific purpose 
purpose in your life that he's called you to accomplish. And he knew full well every choice you were going to make before you ever made it. Okay? That's, the, that, that, that's why foreknowledge is key. You have to understand the foreknowledge of a situation. Foreknowledge is key. Everything God knew in advance, that's what he spoke into and predestined. Is it bugging you? Everything that he knew in advance, he spoke to and he predestined based on his foreknowledge. Okay, based on what he already knew was going to be true. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? All right, so uh, whom he foreknew, as a matter of fact, in Romans 8, we're not going to go there this morning, but we will next week. Romans 8 says, for whom he foreknew, he predestined. Okay, so we'll get into that. So the anointing is not on you to live your life, it's on you to live his life through you. Okay, it's on you to live his life through you. Now, here's your Facebook quote if you're into that, okay? And this is good. You want to write this one down, whether you're into that or not. His presence is always with you. His purpose is always within you. But his anointing is the empowerment that flows up out of you to enable you to accomplish a specific assignment. Okay? His presence is always with you. His purpose is always within you. But his anointing is his empowerment that flows up out of you to enable you to accomplish a specific assignment. Okay? Now you can shorthand that and get the gist of it. I'll put it on Facebook later. <laughs> his anointing is his enablement and empowerment to do things that you could never do in your own strength. Amen? Amen? I'm going to tell you, one of the things for me is just standing up here preaching. I could never do that in my own strength. I was so shy growing up. I didn't kiss my first girl till I was uh, 19, 19 years old. I know that might sound a little silly to some people, but I was shy. I was bashful. I was, I, I, I just lived, it, when I wasn't working, I was living inside my headphones, inside my room. I was either out playing football with the guys or working or stay, staying in my room because I was shy. Always insecure, always timid, always bashful. Never wanted to, never wanted to be the one who had to get up and give book reports or read essays. Uh, I, I, I had to beg my teacher not to fail me in music because I never wanted to get up and sing in front of everybody. You, you get where I'm coming from? So it, only the anointing could have gotten a hold of me to actually put me up in front of crowds of people. That's, the, that's what I'm talking about. That's an empowerment that comes from God to do something you'd never be able to do on your own, okay? Now, the only downside to that is that sometimes when you're anointed, people around you mistake you for being a strong person. And they think, well, he's gifted. He's a good speaker. He's strong or he's that. Or he's strong at that. And, and, the, and you say, well, what does that matter? Well, a lot of times people won't minister to someone that they think is strong. <laughs> So if they think you're strong and they think that you're strong all the time, then they'll not direct any ministry your direction because they don't think you need it. They think you're strong. When in fact, it's not that you're strong, it's that you're anointed. Yeah, and, and under the surface, you're, you're sometimes you're just a frail person like them who still struggles with some of the same things they struggle with. You've learned, though, how to give in to the anointing and let his anointing rise up from without of you, Okay. So the anointing is the helper manifesting in you and manifesting through you. You know who the helper is, right? He's the Holy Spirit. The Greek word is paraclete. He is your companion. He is your guide. He is your helper. He's by your side. Uh, it's when God adds his super to your natural. And when it all comes together, you're able to do the supernatural. Yes. Amen. That's the anointing that comes on us. Now, when you're an anointed person, you're able to do strong things. But the reality is, is that you're not always a strong person. Sometimes it's just a strong anointed. You've learned to function in that gifting. Now, think with me for just a minute about David stepping out on the battlefield to face Goliath that day. I mean, he used a slingshot to knock a giant down. All right, I want to highlight a couple of things here. There was a lot going on that day, but let me just highlight some stuff. Goliath, his name means exile. When you look at what his name means, it means exile, okay? An exile means one who has been stripped of everything valuable and powerful. So Goliath, even though Goliath was an intimidating looking foe because he stood anywhere from 9 to 11 feet tall, uh, uh, okay, and he had all this armor on and he had a, a beam, a, a, a spear that was the size of a weaver's beam, okay? His spear was bigger than David. 
All right. He had all these intimate, this intimidating warfare type of equipment. I need you to get that, okay? He had all this equipment that was strong and sharp and polished, and he was well-versed in how to use it. He was disciplined. He had practiced with it, okay? He looked intimidating, but his identity is the key. That's what I need you to get, okay? His identity was the key. His identity was that he was a stripped exile. Even though he had all this finely polished equipment on, standing out there defying the armies of God and ridiculing the armies of Israel, he, in fact, could not escape from his identity. No matter how big he talked, no matter how bad he talked, no matter how tall he was, no matter how intimidating he looked, he couldn't escape from his identity. He was a stripped exile, okay? Now, David, on the other hand, his name means beloved. Beloved of God, in fact. So Goliath stands out there that day making accusations against the children of God, making threats against the children of God. He's a type of Satan in the New Testament, okay? He's a type of Satan. Goliath is. He's a stripped exile. Now, Colossians, you do know Colossians says that Satan has been stripped yes, yes. of everything. That, that Jesus on the cross made a public open show of him, okay? So he has been stripped. Go back, but it doesn't stop him from making accusations at you because if you aren't established in your identity, you won't know any different. Right. The rest of Israel was sitting out there that day. They had God with them, but they didn't know it. Yeah. Okay, they had Jehovah, Yahweh. They had the living God on their side, but because they weren't secure in their identity, and the only thing that can cause you to be secure in your identity is an abiding relationship. Yeah. It's when you have a relationship with God that establishes your confidence in your identity. Now, that's the thing that, see, David didn't have all of the equipment. He didn't understand the warfare aspect of it. He didn't have the armor. And in fact, when they tried to put Saul's armor on him, he couldn't even move in it. And he said, thanks, but no thanks. I've not tested this. I don't want to wear this. So he goes out there with nothing but his slingshot and five stones that he took out of the brook. That's what he went out there to face this giant with. But he also went out there with his identity intact. Yeah, amen. <laughs> amen. He knew who he was. And he knew whose he was. Amen. He had a relationship with Jehovah. See, all those times he was keeping the sheep out there on the, on the, on the hillside. Uh, while the sheep were grazing, he was singing songs and poetry. Writing poetry to God. He, he was in love with God. God was in love with him. He was chasing after him. God, God would say later, David was a man after my own heart. Amen. Didn't mean David never made mistakes. It meant literally David was a man who chased after my heart. He chased after my heart. He wanted my heart. He wanted my affection. He wanted my attention. David had a relationship with God that was so strong when a bear came out and snatched one of the young lambs away. David rose up and attacked the bear and killed it and took and saved the sheep. When a lion came out, he rose up against the lion and he killed it and he saved the sheep again. Because he had confidence in his relationship, that produced an identity in him that Goliath didn't have. Amen? Are you with me? Yes. Goliath, and no matter how intimidating he looked, he did not have identity, and David did. And David stepped out there that day, and the words that he said out of his mouth were the words he already knew in his heart. The same God who delivered the lion into my hand and the bear into my hand will deliver this uncircumcised Philistine into my hand. Amen? And he came out there with a rock and a slingshot and threw it and hit Goliath right in the forehead and dropped him to the earth on the first throw. Then he went over and took Goliath's own sword and cut his head off right there. Now, that's, I'm not going to get into preaching all the different aspects of that, but that's the, the beautiful thing about identity is that it, it flows from relationship, okay? It flows from relationship. He, didn't ha he had subpar equipment, but he had relationship. <laughs> he had anointing. He had subpar equipment. He, didn't, he had subpar armor. In every aspect, it looked like he was outmanned. It looked like he was outmatched that day. But he had an anointing on his life. And that anointing flowed from his relationship with God, okay? <clears throat> now, have you ever, you ever watched stunt shows before where people just do stuff that's unbelievably scary? And 
I'm not one of those people. <laughs> I mean, I'll live vicariously through them. I enjoy watching them sometimes do that stuff, but I'm not into doing that. I'm not going to get, I mean, if I could get hurt, I'm not interested, okay? And, and so I'll, I'll let them do it. But you watch them do all of this crazy stuff, jumping, uh, jumping all kinds of stuff. I mean, and some of the r ridiculous extremes are evil can evil. You know, jump, trying to see how many feet he can jump, trying to jump the Grand Canyon, all the different things that people like this do. But you know, even on the even on the little the little shows that we watch on TV where there are dangerous stunts involved, you ever notice the disclaimer that they always put on and they have to don't try, don't try this on your own. Don't try this or don't try this at home. Okay? They always put that on there. Don't try this on your own. Now, there's something about the human nature though that makes us see someone else do something and think, I can do that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If they can do that, then I guess, particularly with someone we know. If it's someone we know, we think, well, they're nobody special. I grew up with them. If they can do that, then I can do that. All right? Now, that's just something about the human nature, all right? It, it, it makes it look easier than it, than it really is. <laughs> the anointing on us to accomplish a thing can always make that thing look easier than it really is. One of my favorite commercials is that progressive insurance commercial where there's a guy out there juggling chainsaws. And, and all, there's this guy coming over saying, come on, come on, throw me one. I got this. You know, and he just wanted to jump in there and juggle chainsaws, you know. Uh, and let, let me get down to where you're living, okay? How many of you have ever been driving down the road singing in your car, belting it out along with a CD? And you thought, you know, I don't sound that bad. And then all of a sudden the CD stops. <laughs> <laughs> and you realize when you're singing all alone, you don't sound near as good as you did when you were singing with the band. Amen? Is that just me or is that everybody? <laughs> uh, Paul was doing such extraordinary things that he was making ministry look easy. He was making ministry look easy. His shadow falling on people, clothing, pieces of clothing. Just take, He was so anointed, the anointing was getting in his clothes, getting in handkerchiefs. And they're passing these handkerchiefs out to people. And as soon as they get them, they're being healed of their diseases, delivered and set free from demonic possession and oppression and torment. And so he's making ministry look easy. Now, from the moment that he arrived, don't kid yourself, from the moment that he arrived in that area, these guys have been watching him. These sons of Siva have been watching him do ministry. They've been sitting back in the crowd, watching him cast demons out, watching him heal the sick. And they thought, I can do that. Yeah. I, I'm, and they're taking all the notes. They're writing down the formula. Okay, here's, here's what he does. He just says, in the name of Jesus, yeah. go, yeah. and they go. So they're writing all these notes down. They're taking all these notes. But see, what is the one thing that he has that they don't have? Relationship with Jesus. Okay? So they meet up one day with this possessed man, and they decide to... Cast the devils out of him in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. Now, I think it's noteworthy that they don't know Jesus or Paul. They're trying to use two names that they don't even know. They don't have a relationship with either one of the two men, okay? And so it backfires on him. He was doing such extraordinary things, he made ministry look easy. So they thought, well, if he can do that, I can get up and do that. Now, there's, you know, I could really take off on that. There are a lot of people that think preaching looks easy. If he can do that, I can do that. Well, pastor, and that's easy. I mean, I'm going to go get me some people. I'm going to start me a church because if they can do that, I can do it. You know, man, the anointing sometimes makes things look easier than they really are. I'm telling you, preaching is not easy. Pastoring is not easy. Teaching is not easy. It takes a lot of a lot of discipline, a lot of pouring into stuff, but it takes the anointing. Amen. You've got to have the anointing. So there have been a handful of times in my life where I felt like I didn't have the anointing that I wanted to have in particular situations, and uh, it's not a good feeling. I mean, it leaves you feeling very vulnerable and exposed, and you realize, I'm going to retreat from this situation right now while, while I'm going to get while the getting's good, because I don't feel anointed to be in this particular situation. You know what I'm talking about? See, that's what we're talking about here. These seven sons of Sceva decided that, hey, if Paul can do that, then I'm going to step up and do that too. Uh, so a couple of things that they learned that day. Number one, victory is not as easy as it looks from the outside. That's that's one lesson that they learned. They saw Paul's victories, but they never saw Paul's warfares. Yeah, that's right. 
They never saw what the man went through in his private life. And they're catching Paul at the end of his ministry. They, had, they weren't there at the beginning where he was still trying to sort it out himself, Amen. where he was getting all these revelations that were coming to him, but it was conflicting and he was confused and he was trying to put it all together and where he would finally just retreat for three years, you know, just go off by himself and just take the word that he had and go off and begin to study and pray and let the Holy Spirit get in. They didn't see any of that. All they saw was him standing there talking to demons and the demons obeying him. They came in at the tail end of his ministry when things were rolling and clicking and even his clothing was getting people healed. And they didn't see the warfare that he had fought along the way though, okay? Uh, another thing that they learned is that numbers don't necessarily mean more power. There were seven of them. Seven of them fighting against this one man, okay? Seven of these guys trying to do what Paul did. And they figured out real quick it was not about the numbers. It was about the anointing. Amen? Now, odds, odds against you will not deter you or hold you back when the anointing is on you to accomplish a certain thing. Amen? Anytime the anointing is on you, it doesn't matter. Because if you have the anointing and you realize that, you understand that. And, and, and don't lose sight of the fact that I'm differentiating between the presence of God that's in your life always, that abiding presence, but there's an empowerment, an enablement, an anointing that comes on for specific purposes and tasks, okay? Because that's what I want you to understand. And uh, don't lose sight of the fact that when you have an anointing, those that are with you are always more than those that are with them. Amen? Amen? Always. And let me put it this way, numbers are not where the success is either. Growing a large church is not as important as growing a powerful church. I don't care anything about growing a large church in this town. I don't care anything about this apostolic center becoming one of the largest ones around. I care about it becoming one of the most powerful things in this region. One of the most powerful ones in this area where the power of God, the presence of God is moving and manifesting in the demonstration of power and authority. Amen. That's what I care about. Uh, then they also learned that there's always going to be a day you might pretend for a while and you might play for a while and get by with it, but eventually there's going to be a day where evil hits you head on. Yeah. And when it does and you're standing there toe-to-toe -to -toe with it, then all the pretend games are over. Right. <laughs> They're all over right at that moment. Something will rise up against you that if you're not anointed, it will give you the beatdown of a lifetime. Yeah. And that's what happened to these seven guys, Okay. But, but another thing that, that, that I want you to learn today is when you know who you are in Christ, the kingdom of darkness also knows who you are in Christ. When you know who you are, the kingdom will, of darkness also knows who you are. The enemy knows who you are. And it's important to understand your identity so you can begin to flow and operate from that position, okay? You remember, do you remember when, God, uh, when, when Satan came to God in, in the book of Job and he asked him, where have you been? And Satan said, from going to and for, to and fro on the earth, you know, looking for people that I could uh, come against. And God says, have you considered my servant Job? Do you remember what Satan said to him? He said, yeah. I mean, he didn't say, no, who's Job? He, he knew who Job was. And do you know how? He gave it away in his next statement. He said, yeah, I've considered him. And when I tried to run at him, I hit a force field head on. Yeah. I know who Job is because you have a hedge around his life. Yeah. That's what the devil was saying. I've already tried to go down that path, and you have him so well protected that when I tried to hit Job, I hit you instead. Yeah. So he knew who Job was. Yeah. Amen. Now these guys, though, when they, when they try to cast these spirits out in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preached, they don't have a relationship with either one. And the demons said, we know Jesus. And one translation said, we've heard about Paul also, but who are you? Who are you? All right, now, <clears throat> I want to bring that up for just a second, all right? Uh, when stuff comes your way and starts pressing on you on every side, the question that it often asks is, who are you? That's the question that really comes up when you're finding yourself in crisis moments, you're finding yourself facing resistance, and you're finding attacks on every side, and all of a sudden something is hitting you, and the question that is being asked by the oppositional force is, who are you? 
who are you? Okay, that's the question that's being asked. So he knew who he was. Now, I want to ask you this morning, and this is just a rhetorical question. You don't have to, to shout an answer out. But do you have the depth of relationship with God that causes even your enemy to know who you are? Are you close enough to the, to the Lord where even the enemy knows who you are? All right. Now, now bear with me for a couple more minutes. All right. I'm going to, walk, I'm going to wrap this up here real quick. I'm not trying to lay a foundation of works here, you know, works-based faith where I'm trying to imply that there are things you can do to get God to love you more. I'm not trying to do that, okay? But I am saying this. There's a depth of relationship that's founded on his incredible love for you that pulls you into that love, pulls you into that abiding presence where you begin to fall so much in love with him. You pursue him passionately, daily, nightly. You dream about him. You think about him. You read about him. You sing to him when you're driving up and down the road. It pulls you into the type of relationship with Jesus where, where, where you're just, there, there is a life in you that is stirred constantly at the thought of his name, at the sound of his name, at the mention of his name, at the mere suggestion that his presence is in the building you begin to weep and you begin to feel your emotions stirred as the king begins to manifest his presence because you're in love with him, he's in love with you and you understand that relationship. And when stuff comes your way and it starts pressing on you on every side, instead of squeezing the life out of you, it squeezes the life of Christ out of you. Now that's the type of relationship that I'm talking about. When the enemy puts the squeeze on you or when life, that bothers you theologically for me to say that, then let's put it this way. When life puts the squeeze on you, all right, we tidied it up <laughs> because life squeezes everybody. When life puts the squeeze on you, what is going to come up out of you? Are people going to look and say, who are you? Or are they going to see Christ being squeezed out of you? Amen. Amen. See, people will see real quick that when you get squeezed and pressed on every side, uh, they'll see it real quick that instead of you appearing, he appears. Yes. He appears. And then you appear with him in glory. Amen. You see, now that, that, that brings that verse into relevance that we were talking about a while ago. This demon-possessed man asked these guys, who are you? I've looked on my watch list. And I've got Jesus' name on the guys on the list of names to watch out for. I see Paul's name on that list. I see Peter. There are different ones on that list. But I've checked that list, and your name's not on there. None of you seven boys, in fact. <laughs> None of y'all's names are on my list, okay? So when trouble comes knocking on your door, inevitably it will ask everyone the same question. Who are you? Who are you, okay? And as people around you watch you respond to moments of crisis in your life, my question is, who are they seeing appear? Who are they seeing appear in moments of crisis? Now, now Christ is in you. We know that. Amen. We know that Christ in you is your hope of glory. Christ is in you. But who's answering the door when trouble knocks? Okay, that's what I'm asking. I'm not disputing that Christ is in every one of us. I'm asking who answers the door when trouble knocks. Who's appearing out of you when trouble knocks on the door of your life? Amen? Because I believe that what's going on is monumental in the church world right now. There is an epic move of, of His Holy Spirit that is causing us to make this transitional shift to where we're starting to manifest Christ out of us. We're not manifesting denominations anymore. I mean, it's shifting. I mean, this still it still hasn't shifted the way that it needs to, but it has begun. Yes. It has begun, and you will not convince me otherwise because I've done enough traveling to see it. It has begun around the world. It has begun in America. There's a shift taking place. He's moving selfish control, sent control freak leaders out of the way. He's moving them out of the way, and he's putting people in that don't require all of the control, don't have to be in charge of everything, aren't insecure, they're not intimidated, they'll yield to the glory of God, yield way to the manifestation of God's presence. He's moving and shifting and realigning, and we're seeing denominations uh, that, that he's tried to deal with and tried to move in, and, and they've not responded. We're seeing them begin to dry up. We're seeing them begin to fade. We're seeing them begin to wither. And we're seeing mass migrations of people over into churches that are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're seeing that around the world. People are leaving churches where they've been beat with legalism their entire life. And they're making this exodus, this transition 
over to churches that are preaching about the love of God and the grace of God and New Covenant theology, New Covenant doctrine. And we're going to see it even on a larger scale. Amen. On a larger scale. Because as people see that, they're going to see Christ appearing in you and they're going to want that. They're going to want that as well. Ephesians 4 and 1, just one verse here says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the calling wherewith you were called. Now that verse has inspired a lot of performance-based messages over the years, okay? But I want to, I want you to just, I just want to show you one thing out of it, okay? Looking at both sides of the cross, before and after, it helps us understand the work of the cross. And when you look at both sides of that verse, Ephesians 4 and 1, it helps you to understand what the Apostle Paul was talking about. All right, verse 1 has a pivot word in it. It starts off, therefore. Therefore is always there for a reason, okay? So to understand what he's talking about in Ephesians 4 and 1, therefore let us walk worthy of the calling wherewith you are called. Uh, the, the message Bible says, let us walk in light of. In light of. So it makes you wonder what light are we talking about? And you have to go back to Ephesians 3. In, in, in Ephesians 3, he begins, and you have to look at how he how he writes in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 8, all the way down through 21. He's writing about the mystery of the church, about the church being revealed and, and the manifold wisdom of God being made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. He goes on and he talks about uh, how you have you have uh, riches, you have an inheritance, and he prays for them that they be uh, strengthened uh, with in, in, with his spirit in their inner man, that Christ might dwell in their hearts through faith, being rooted and grounded in love, that they'd be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height, to know the love of Christ, which passes all knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to every generation. Then he says, let us walk therefore worthy of the calling whereby we've been called. Okay, so it brings us to that verse. Now we understand that what he's talking about, that calling is to manifest the Son of God out of us. That, man, that, that calling that's on our life is that we have the Son living on the inside of us, and every one of us have a calling to manifest that life outside of us. Amen? That's the calling. And those of us who love His appearing are beginning to understand that, that our calling, and we're anointed to live this life. The word Christ is the Greek word Christo, which means anointing or anointed one. And it has in the verse that says, I can do all things to... Through Christ, which strengthens me, it's the Greek word Christo, and he's talking about I can do all things through the anointing, which strengthens me. Yes. We've read it for so many years as if it's talking about a person, and it is, it is, okay. But the King James says I can do all things through Christ, comma, which strengthens me. Now, if it was talking about the person Jesus, it would have said who? It would have said I can do all things through Christ, who strengthens me. But by saying which, it leads me to believe that it's talking about the anointing of Christ. The anointing. I can do all things through the anointing which strengthens and empowers me. Yes. Amen. Amen. That's the anointing that we're talking about. Now, these sons of Sceva didn't have the anointing flowing in their life because they didn't have a relationship. Amen. I believe you have a relationship. So stand with me this morning. I'm going to... I want to wrap it up with some prayer. You have a relationship. What I want to challenge you to do is to begin letting that relationship produce an anointing in your life that will empower you and enable you to fulfill your purpose and your calling, whatever God has called you to do. The reason why it ties so beautifully into the worship this morning, if you didn't catch all of the, the tie-ins, you know, even Marty made the statement that the Lord spoke to him and he said, I, I've anointed you so that when you sing songs, people are going to be healed. That, that's the anointing. I mean, there's nothing that Marty could generate out of himself that would heal an individual. And there's nothing I could generate out of myself either. So what he was basically telling him is I've given you an enablement, an empowerment, that if you that if, if your relationship with me is intact then I'm, and you'll let it flow, not be afraid to let it flow, 
Amen. Then I will begin to heal people as that anointing is in operation. And it's the same way with preaching. It's the same way with teaching. Whatever it is that God's called you to do. It might not be singing. He definitely hadn't anointed me to sing. <laughs> Amen. He definitely hasn't anointed me to dance either. I'm not going to demonstrate. You're going to have to take my word for it. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. But how many of you would just say, Pastor Mark, I... I want his anointing, his enablement right now in this season of my life to begin to flow through me and to empower me, to enable me to do the things that God has called me to do. Amen. Thank you for those hands. I see hands going up all over the place. Why would we not want that, right? Amen. Why would we not want that? Hallelujah. Join hands all over the building. Establish some kind of connection that hands are full or something. Just reach out and touch someone on the shoulder or the arm. Let's get a connection going throughout the place. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you for your anointing in this house. Your presence is here. Your presence is within every one of us. Your purpose is within every one of us. But Lord, what we're specifically asking for right now, we're yielding to that empowerment, that enablement, that anointing that will come up from out of us and empower us to do God things in the earth. Empower us to heal the sick. Empower us, Father God, to cast out devils. Empower us to sing, to preach, to prophesy, to pray, to be led by your Spirit. Empower us to walk around manifesting Christ out of our lives every day. Father, I pray for Marty as well right now. I thank you for the anointing on my brother. I thank you, Father God, that, that today was a key. It was a prophetic key. An unlocking took place. As he stood up here and spoke those words out of his mouth, I declare he was releasing that from this day forward there will be healings take place under his ministry. As he's singing, as he's playing, Father, it doesn't even matter if he thinks he's being prophetic or not. If he is anointed, that's what matters. Your anointing is on him, Father. We agree with that word. We align with that today. And as he has released those words out of his mouth, we say, so be it. Every time he steps up here to sing, Father God, I fully expect people to be healed. People to be set free. People to be delivered in the presence of God because of your anointing. Because of the richness of your anointing. Because of your favor, because of your increase that's in this place. Thank you for your anointing. Father, there are some here in this house that are anointed to pray. And Father, I declare that the, that the anointing on our prayer warriors is going to increase. The understanding is going to increase. The clarity, the focus is going to increase. And they're going to begin to pray under a stronger anointing than they've ever experienced before. And just because some of us in the house might not be anointed to pray, we're not going to speak out against that. That just simply means that, that we don't have a specific anointing that someone else has, but we support them in their calling. We support them in their gifting. We support our brothers and sisters. Father, there are those here that are anointed to preach, anointed to teach. And we stir the gift in them this morning. As your hands are laid on each other right now, I declare a stirring of the Holy Ghost take place right now. There are some here that are anointed for business. I hear this in my spirit that there are at least three, three to five people that are here today that are anointed for business. You've been given an anointing to succeed at business. And so, Father, we release that in the mighty name of Jesus. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, your anointing flows, anointing to break every chain, anointing, Father God, to set the captive free, to preach the gospel and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, to preach the good news, the glad tidings to those who haven't heard it. Thank you for your anointing this morning. Thank you for your anointing in our lives. And Father, I just pray that you would increase the richness of your abiding presence with us. Father, in the days ahead, I pray that you would begin to reveal yourself to everyone in our church. Reveal yourself to everyone in our church. Let them see you. Let them hear you. That might happen in different ways and forms for different ones of us. But I declare that everyone in this church will hear the voice of God. 
They will know the voice of God. They'll see manifestations. They'll experience miracles and healings, dreams and visions, and prophetic giftings flowing in this house and through this house. We thank you that every need is met, Father. And we're not sitting around fretting and stressing, but we know that you have touched our natural with your super, and you've made it supernatural. And we thank you that every need has been met supernaturally. We thank you, Father God, that you're blessing this place with your favor and your increase. In Jesus' name, if you agree, shout amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Give him a hand clap of praise.